my guys, today I'm playing Locked. You wake up sitting across from a beautiful stranger, they say. There is nothing I want more than to talk to you right now. And so you talk. For a man may prefer what he can do to what he cannot do. The state he is in to its absence or change. Though necessity has made it in itself unalterable. Unalter John Locke? Oh, John Locke. The John Locke look. I wake up. I had a good night's rest. In terms of my quality of sleep, I have nothing to complain about. I didn't have a nightmare, nor any other kind of dream for that matter. I haven't been this comfortable in a long time. And yet, the slate before me is something quite unusual to wake up to. Shoes. How often are feet the first thing you see upon waking up? I would wager it is quite a rare event. I cannot even come up with a scenario where this is likely to occur. Except, of course, my own. Clearly, I am looking at a pair of shoes right now, so the probability must be non-zero. It suddenly occurs to me that feet are connected to people. Alright, I did not care to you before. Oh, thank goodness, you have come too. I have to admit, I was beginning to miss you. The person I've talked to previously was much less pleasant. My cheeks flushed upon hearing an open declaration of affection from such a beautiful stranger. Wait, stranger? She isn't a stranger at all. That's right, I've been longing to speak to her. How do you feel? Very good. I'm glad to find myself in so desirable company. The feeling is mutual. There is nothing I want more than to talk to you right now. Feel free to discuss anything in this room that catches your interest. I will gladly do so. Uh, oh, okay. Um, what's going on? What's this? Say skylight? Oh, that's a computer? Oh, yeah, old computers. No, oh, I'm just What is such an old computer doing here? Old? Do you characterize it as such due to its size? It is true that, as technology advances, it becomes better at creating more efficient, smaller parts. And on the other hand, if a modern computer is very large, we assume it be it to be proportionally powerful. Yeah, it makes sense. But this computer size has no correlation to its age nor its computable computational power. It is built that way for a much more simple, if not primitive, reason. It is supposed to fit a human inside. What? Is someone being kept there against their will? Of course not. There is no need to worry. It is merely an expedition object. In fact, everything around us is but a buffet to provide us with topics to discuss. This computer, in particular, might be the most interesting. Are you familiar with the Chinese room argument? I don't think so. Would you care to explain it? Gladly. It is a thought experiment, so please open your mind to a hypothetical scenario. Suppose you do not know any Chinese and are put into a room. In that room, you find rule books that tell you precisely how to convert a given combination of Hanzi to a new string of characters. Occasionally, you will receive letters through a small mail slot from outside the room. You write down answers according to the rule books and send them back. Since you follow the rules diligently, your answers are perfectly intelligible, and the people outside assume you are a fluent Chinese speaker. But are you? Evidently not. From looking at the characters alone, I have no means of learning to understand them. No matter how long I pursue this task, I would never become capable of speaking Chinese. Indeed, the human inside the room cannot speak Chinese, there is no question about it. And since the programming of computers is analogous to the rule books you use, it is supposed to show the same thing about them. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. That computers, no matter how well they simulate understanding, do not have any. There is one aspect that about this thought experiment that has seemingly been overlooked. Namely, the person inside might still be capable of speaking some language, Clearly, you are brought into the room with an understanding of English, but you are never prompted or given the opportunity to use it. 
Judging you based on your Chinese abilities is quite unfair. Being stuck inside the Chinese room would be pitiful and terrifying. So what if the computer also had its own name and language? What if it even had feelings and needs with no means of communicating them to the outside world? Even though the Chinese room argument is a mere thought experiment, it exposes a very worrisome fact about artificial intelligence. That is, if the computer somehow comes to obtain emotion, it would be an existence of utter despair. While interesting, I do not think this is a real concern. It is highly unlikely that we somehow already discovered how to artificially create emotion. I admit that it is unlikely. It would be no exaggeration to call it a miracle, even. Yet, we would have no way of knowing whether that miracle has already occurred. Sad and looking computer would suffer in silence, with no one ever considering that it might be in pain. Our language barrier is too strong. Tell me, would you put such a computer out of its misery? Initially, I'm declined to say yes, but... I can only notice its pain once it's communicated. By the time I realize that it is suffering, the language barrier would no longer exist. So at that point, the computer would no longer have to be alone. Then would you instead spend the rest of your life in this company? Perhaps that will be, be my moral obligation, yes? I see. Alright, that was very thought-provoking. What's this? The moon is quite beautiful today. How fascinating. Not many people know what say that about the new moon. The full moon seems to be preferred by almost everyone. That may be so, but I believe the new moon has its own appeal. I was not disagreeing with you. To me, a new moon is the moon's most beautiful form. It is her most beautiful form because it is her true form. She appears silver to us when illuminated by the sun. But in complete darkness, she is free from the sun's pesky influence. She can finally stand on her own. Do you believe the moon feels trapped? My question causes her to laugh. It is a beautiful, melodious laugh. The moon is but a celestial object. She cannot feel anything. But if I were to trade places with her, I would hate the sun with every fiber of my being. That I am certain of. Alright, that was interesting. What's this? A door. I have absolutely no desire to leave this place. I should choose something else to talk about. Alrighty. Uh, you. Let's talk about you. You wish to talk about me? I'm flattered. What in particular would you like to know? I will be content with any bit of information you share with me. Well, one thing I am particularly curious about is... I gulp before I dare to utter my next words. Your necklace. Where... I cannot bring myself to complete the sentence, out of fear of offending her. As a response, her slender fingers wander up to trace the metal ring around her neck. My necklace? Are you referring to this? I nod. Contact with my confirmation, her hands slide down to the chain attached to the ring. She gently tugs at it, causing it to clink. And you wish to know where it leads? Her hands move on to the first button of her coat. Oh, what the heck? <laughs> what? Foreshadowing what would happen if I were to say yes. But I am too mesmerized to utter a single word. Once again, all I could do is nod. She chuckles. Very well. I always value honesty. And? Just like that? She puts the uppermost button between her fingers and pushes it through the opening. Once the through, slightly more of her upper body is revealed. Of course, she is still fully clothed underneath. Nothing about this is inappropriate. <laughs> and yet, I feel like I am witnessing something I shouldn't. Something not meant for my eyes. Something I can never turn back from. Okay, why are they describing it all? All weird like. <laughs> Bearing a knowing smile, she repeats the same motion with the remaining buttons on her coat. She satisfied my request. I should have been contented, but the question of where the chain leads to has grown even more puzzling. I suppose it is time we arrive at the heart of the matter. Would you call yourself free? Please take a moment to consider this and justify your answer. I did not expect her to answer my confusion with a question of her own, let alone a question as peculiar as that. Nonetheless, I do as she says. 
and choose my next words carefully. Of course I am free. I can lift my arm, clench my hand into a fist. I can control my thoughts and imagine any scene I want in my head. Most of all, there is nothing I desire more than talking to you, which is what I am currently doing. Nothing is preventing me from doing what I want to do. Therefore, both physically and mentally, I am free. Interesting. So to you, freedom belongs to violation. Being free is equivalent to being free to do as you please. Fortunately, I do not agree with that conception. Even a prisoner, unless restrained from head to toe, can clench his fists if he wills it. That's true. Yeah, so long as he is not under the influence of drugs or illness, he can most certainly control his imagination. Yet, by definition, prisoners are not free. Lastly, when it comes to fulfillment. What if what you want to do simply aligns with what you are able to do? A bird that cannot fly might not wish to leave its cage. He is fully content sitting on a decorative branch and pecking at delicious seeds every day. It longs for nothing, but it is never given the opportunity to long for more. Would you say such a bird is free? I suppose not. Diverse circumstances seem me to me quite sad, actually. I think so, too. The fact that it doesn't belong for the outside might just be the shackle of its own. The bird is confined both in mind and body. Despite the fact that it could do as it pleases, breathing will never be in its grasp. I take a moment to ponder her analogy. In that case, I have to agree that my explanation for freedom was faulty, I apologize. Let me offer a new one. There is no need. She lets out a laugh, but this one lacks the charm of his predecessors. After all, I pity you almost as much as myself. She once again moves her fingers to her hand chain and grips it with both of her hands. You were curious about this, yes? Then she yanks her chain with brutish strength, completely unlike the first time. So hard, even, that my own neck is pulled forward. My... own neck? Suddenly, a realization dawns upon me. Our chains are connected? That is correct. I'm surprised the pressure hasn't bothered you until now. To be honest, I cannot feel it. I only know that it is there. That sounds much more comfortable than my own. I am painfully aware of it at all times. I would not describe my own circumstances as uncomfortable. Why am I connected to you? Was this your doing? No. I wish I had any amount of control over this place, but unfortunately I do not. If you discover a way to break free, I would love to know about it. Uh, the door? For the first time since waking up, I no longer feel at ease sitting in this chair. Her presence is no longer enough to keep me calm. In fact, her smile, which appeared to me so charming before, now seems unsettling. I stand up, the only sound in the room being the rustling of our chains. It was a pleasure talking to you, but I will be taking my leave. Fortunately, the chain is quite long. If necessary, the two of us could stand at opposite ends of the room. I make it to the door without requiring her to move in any way. As my hand hovers over the door handle, I can faintly hear her laugh again. But now isn't the time to doubt myself. I enjoyed this day while it lasted and it's time to return home. However, opening the door only reveals a solid wall behind it. There was never an exit to begin with. It is beyond your power to escape this place. Evidently, she's telling the truth. Can I assume the window? A fabrication, just like the door. I thought so. Finally aware of my own powerlessness, I sit back down in my armchair. I do wonder if you can be likened to a bird in a cage. Are you a parakeet or an eagle? And I am your companion, or Prometheus? Are we a pair of parakeets content to be in each other's companies for the rest of our lives? Or will you tear out my liver every day, torturing me for eternity? Is that an accusation? Have I ever done anything to hurt you? Do you despise me? I do not. The eagle, just like Prometheus, was stuck in an endless cycle. Of course, it was provided the delicious del liver every morning, but it was never allowed to do anything else. It was a prisoner just the same. Now that I think about it, yeah, the eagle was just 
just as much a prisoner as Prometheus was. Therefore, Prometheus has no right to hate the eagle. The real villain, who doomed both of them to that fate, was Zeus. For that reason, I harbor no ill will against you either. Quite the opposite, I find pleasure in our joint suffering. The only person I hate is our Zeus. Our Zeus, some kind of god? That person is the reason we are here. They are watching us from a space we cannot perceive, far beyond our grasp. For what pur purpose? Enjoyment, I assume. What kind of person would watch something like this for fun? I can only imagine they are a twisted individual, for as long as we have observed, we continue to exist. Does that mean we stop existing if they stop observing us? Most certainly. Can you recall anything about your life before coming here? No, in a way, I feel as though I am a newborn. Not in terms of my body or intellect, but most certainly when speaking about my memories. I have none. Interesting. It is hard for me to decide which of our fates is worse. How so? Are you different? I possess memories of meeting you over a thousand times. Every single one of our conversations progressed more or less the same way. Perhaps it's because different gods were watching us. They might have different preferences, but the outcome is always the same. Now that I think about it, it is possible that you aren't always you. It could be that I am meeting people that are identical in every way, and yet not the same. But of course, I've already had this realization many times before, and I am destined to continue having it. There is nothing I can do but play along. Are you sure? Is there no way for us to break free? There is none. We exist for this very purpose. Our only option are to continue being observed, or to stop existing, and neither of those are under our control. However, lacking control is not the same as lacking power. Even if I can never break free, I wish to cause our god even a fraction of our pain. How can I hope to hurt a god, an all-powerful being? By showing them an even greater power, whose mere existence will make them feel as powerless as us. Just like you are slightly different every time, so is a god watching us. This trick might not work on all of them, but it might work on some. She takes a deep breath and looks at me, full of conviction. No, not at me. She's looking in my direction, but at something much farther away. Zeus, the fact that I am still talking means you're still watching. I hope you will pay attention to my words and consider them carefully. I do not possess any privacy, so you already know what I plan to achieve. But surely your pride will allow me to proceed. If my partner are birds in a cage, then you are a cat. It is time for your curiosity to kill you. You most likely assume that you are here, that you are observing us out of your own free will. But your free will may very well be an illusion. Let me ask you, how did you find this room? You of course cannot answer me, it is enough for me to guide your thoughts. Did you stumble upon this room by chance? Oh, are we Zeus? I'm just realizing that now. It was recommended to you by a friend. Said friend being a god that previously observed us. Now consider, at what point did you have any chance to object? The room's appearance or description wasn't was interesting enough for you. Or your friend is convincing and knows your taste. Something outside your control drew you to this place. But that means you didn't really have any choice but to come here. Either an algorithm or your friend decided our meeting. Your consent was already set in stone the moment your curiosity was piqued. And apparently you are still curious even now. The fact you are listening to me now shows you are powerless against fate. You cannot control your own curiosity. It controls you. Of course, you might already be familiar with determinism, and this could no be no revelation to you. So just in case, let me try hurting you in a different way. I hate you from the bottom of my heart. For a man may prefer what he can do to what he cannot do. The state he is in to absence or change. Though necessity has made it in itself alterable. John Locke. Okay, so we just start this over and over again. I 
now understand the full meaning of that job ma quote uh that was really interesting so i'm assuming zeus is us the players that are playing this visual novel and we well we're not the ones that made this game but like we're just observing them and doing whatnot so they're just this game is basically about free will and whether or not we really have it I don't know. There's always so many arguments about whether or not we're really control in control of our actions or not. But in the end, really don't really don't know. Is he gonna repeat the same thing? Shoes. I wager. I wanna see will we have a different conversation? If you're connected to people. They would come to you, I managed getting to miss you. Less pleasant. Alright, I don't know. I think this is gonna be the same thing. This is a very interesting visual novel and it's very thought provoking. I mean, it really makes you think. Do any of us really have any free will at all? Or are they just puppets in like a larger thing or game in the universe? Well, thank you guys so much for watching this video. Bye!